I can argue that all of us, not just the 700 million who are hungry in rural areas in the south, in the global south, need small farmers. All of us do. Because if we're going to survive climate change, my country, Canada, or the United States, or your countries, we're all going to need those small farmers to get us through it. They brought the diversity, they brought the innovation and the creativity to help us do it. And certainly the companies won't. But what is the strategy of the companies? I mean, what do they say they're going to do for us to get through climate change? The breeding companies aren't actually breeding for food anymore. The breeding companies are developing biomass. Not crops, biomass. The goal is to produce a quantity of biomass that can be used for any purpose. At the end of the day, it can be feed, it can be food, it can be pharmaceuticals, it can be biofuels, it can be plastics, it can be building materials, it can be wherever they think it needs, is needed at that time. The idea is to produce biomass, nothing else. They think that they can turn all the aim to be made from fossil fuels, of course, the old fossil fuels to be made into, to be used by simply using carbohydrates from living materials. The famous carbohydrate economy. They think they can do it now. So the orientation is that. The most shocking statement I've heard in the last while, in fact, was just a few months ago. I won't name the company because it was an off the record discussion, but one of the largest of the seed companies said that was talking about this idea of producing biomass. That was the goal. And talking about, they said, don't you know that right now we're only commercializing, we're only commodifying 23.8% of the world's terrestrial annual biomass, which means that 76.2% of the annual biomass production of the planet hasn't been commodified yet. So that's the big raw material. How do we capture all that free biomass? How do we turn that into a more profitable market? And the market is huge. I mean, there's the multi-trillion dollar, of course, fuels market, which everyone focuses on. But there's also the $1.8 trillion per year plastics market. There's also the $1.2 trillion a year market for building materials and new innovative building materials as well, besides the food and the feed. The job is to take those basic products that Michael Pollan always tells us about, how much we use of corn and soybeans and wheat and rice, and turn those into this massive production of biomass. I think we can fairly call, we used to talk about, in my organization, we used to talk about the gene giants. Now it's the new biomasters. And of course, that they've got a new technology. Um, the meeting I was at, as I mentioned a couple of years ago, on synthetic biology really emphasized that point. If you talk to synthetic biologists, and there are lots of them, and they're growing very rapidly, your, your Secretary of Energy here in the United States has that as, as his background at Berkeley, and others in, in, in the Energy Department as well. If you talk to them, they, they would agree with us. Almost everything we say about GM crops, they would say you're right. It's a dumb idea, sloppy science. What's well, a stupid thing to move a gene from one species into another? You don't know what's going to happen to that. Look at things we're learning about DNA every day and RNA and so on. How can we really think that we can actually create that kind of transfer in a way that we can trust the results? It's expensive, it's clumsy, everything else. They all agree with that. Their solution is. Do it yourself. Build your own DNA. Build it from the bottom up. Because with synthetic biology, you actually construct your own DNA, base pair by base pair. And they're doing that. They're doing it very successfully. Uh, that's why BP gave $500 million to Berkeley to develop biomass, to use synthetic biology to make that biomass. That's why they're now investing more than a billion dollars per year, more than a billion dollars, in breeding biomass plants and algae and so on as well.
because they're saying, let's not move a letter of the code of life, the book of life from one book to another, one part of the book to another. Let's write our own chapters. Let's construct it ourselves. That today is a doable project. That's not a myth of uh, five years from now or ten years from now. That can be done now. That's being done now. So we're moving in a sense from genetically modified organisms to atomically modified organisms. And they're moving again extraordinary rapids, extraordinary amounts of money to make that possible. The estimate is that the synthetic biology industry will be 10 times the size of the biotech industry by 2015. That's the pace of the change. And these guys who say they can build DNA and do build DNA say they don't just have to deal with the usual four-letter DNA. They've actually already gone to building six-letter DNA. Well, can you imagine that if you can actually construct life forms with six-letter DNA, you can have more unnatural biodiversity in a test tube than you can have in all of the Amazon, perhaps all over the world. It's natural. And they're saying that's what we need to do to get through with the problems of fossil fuels. That's what we need to do to produce enough biomaterials to feed a new planet under climate change. That's the kind of biomass that has to be constructed. And that work is proceeding, again, with incredible rapidity. You know, some of the world's top scientists, Craig Bender, for example, you know Craig Bender? Scientists who gave us um, the, the, uh, the, the private sector side of the mapping of the human genome back in the year 2000. Craig Bender's got $600 million a few weeks ago for his work with the energy companies in developing biomass. $600 million for this field. Money that the land grant colleges would die for. Also, don't have to be a suicide for already, probably, in terms of the research. That's what's being developed. And so, one end of the food system. The other end of the food system, we have the retail side. I was aware that there's rapid growth in supermarkets in major urban areas in, in Latin America and in Asia. I wasn't aware how rapidly it's growing now in Africa, Sub Saharan Africa. So, what we're seeing now is an elimination of traditional food supply systems in Africa and Asia and Latin America, and the replacement not just by supermarkets, but by the hypermarkets as well. An industry study that came out a few weeks ago says, this is an industry investment study, says that plans are already in play now with the five major retail companies, including one South African company, ShopRise, in Africa, all of Africa, to move in 1,700 hypermarkets throughout Sub-Saharan Africa. And their estimate is that will replace, unfortunately, 390,000 family-based food shops with the 1,700 companies, hypermarkets. And they're moving not just into the big, wealthier parts of the bigger cities, they're moving into the smaller cities and moving into the lower income parts of those cities. Saying that they can organize the system and squeeze the farmers well enough to get cheaper food to people in the cities. And they're claiming in places like Madagascar and, and Senegal that they can actually go so far as to work with small farmers to make them part of the system. But if you look back at what they said in 2003 and what they're doing in 2009, they got rid of all the small farmers and now they're just working with the big farmers. And big farmers are getting bigger and bigger and bigger than the small farmers are doing what the World Bank said they should do. Move to the cities. All the lost that diversity and everything with them.